know how to move the machine around. Now we're going to be manipulating it in order to, along with manipulating our patient, in order to do actual X-rays. Now, before we actually get to the positioning part, I do want to review Aidip again with all of you. Right? So, this week we're going to be doing chest demo. Next week, practice. Week after is going to be test out. Part of your test out is to perform Aidip for me. Okay? So, I do recommend that you develop a kind of like a flow chart for your aid to know what order you want to do things in. Okay. So, for example, if I was doing aid, um, the way I like to do aid is I'll come to the waiting room, right? Let's say that I've got some patients here and I'll call a name. Okay, so I request, okay, looking for Sindhu. All right, so, okay, I found my patient, right? And so, First thing I'm going to do is introduce myself. Right? Who is this strange person calling my name? Right. So, um, good afternoon. My name is Wilson. I'm here to take you for your X-rays. Okay? And if I am speaking to a patient, I want to try and keep my language short and simple. Right? So I'm not going to say I'm going to bring you over to the radiology department. Right? I'm just going to be okay. I'm here to take you for your X-rays. Um, can I just Double check, what is your name and date of birth? Right, so I'll get the information from my patient. Afterwards, may I check your wristband? Right. I always make sure to ask name and date of birth first before asking to see the wristband. And the reason for that is because when I asked for patient's wristbands first, this is what happens. Okay, may I see the wristband? Oh, yeah, sure, here's the wristband. Okay, thank you. All right, and then could you tell me your name and date of birth? Yeah, well, um, my <laughs> name is Wilson, and my date of birth is, hold on, wait a second. <laughs> you are the patient, right? Why are you reading off your wristband? I, okay, I don't know why, but if you remind patients they have a wristband, they read off their wristband. So I always ask name and date of birth first, and then only once I have that do I check the wristband, right? That's just something that I've learned from working for a while. Okay, so I've confirmed that is, it is the patient. So now, right, so if you would follow me, I'm going to bring you over to X-ray. Right? Walk, 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 walk. We get in the room, and now this is when I'm going to go into more detail. So I've done my acknowledgement, I've done my introduction, but now we're going to get into, okay, a bit more explanation. So, um, how are you doing today? What's going on? What kind of issues are you having? Why are you here at the hospital? Right? Things like that. So like, oh, well, I'm here because of shortness of breath. I've got chest pain, something like that. All right, great. So that matches what I have here on my request. Like, okay, great. So we will be doing some x-rays for your chest today. We're going to be taking two to three pictures. This is going to take five to ten minutes. Right, so I don't ever like giving a concrete time. And the reason is because you give a concrete time, patients will hold you to that time. If I say five minutes, they expect it to be five minutes. Even if something goes wrong, even if I need to restart the room, even if I have to repeat images, they expect it to be five minutes because that's what I said at first. So I always try and give myself some wiggle room. I always overestimate how long it will take for the exam. If I think the exam is going to take five minutes, I'm going to say, okay, well, this exam will take no more than 10 minutes. Right? I'm going to say 10 minutes. Right? I'm going to overestimate how long I think I'm going to be in here. So even if something does go wrong, even if I need to step off for a moment and do some other unexpected things, I am still going to be within my given duration. Does that make sense? Right? So if you do take the whole time, then great, at least you gave yourself that legal room. If you take less time, now the patient feels happier because they got done sooner than what you said. So that is how I like to do duration. Something else I like to do is maybe tell them how many x-rays to expect. So we can do two to three pictures. Okay. That way, 
if they're if I don't want to give them an exact time, I can maybe give them an image amount instead. Um, all right. And then we need to do dressing and LMP. Right? So um, in this group, right, we have all females, so it's very important that we do check pregnancy status and LMP when doing aided, especially during test out. Um, Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. What did you say? LMP? Uh, LMP, last menstrual period. Oh, last menstrual period. Mm -hmm. And for me, I always check pregnancy first and then LMP. Okay. And because personally, I just feel like it's kind of weird to ask LMP and it's like, oh yeah, I haven't had a period in 10 days. And it's like, okay, well, are you pregnant? Right? Personally, I like to ask, okay, any chance you might be pregnant first? No? Okay, let me verify that by checking the last menstrual period. Right? If they say yes, then I can just stop there. I don't need to ask about LMP. So, any chance you might be pregnant? No. Okay, when was your last menstrual cycle? Five days ago, eight days ago, ten days ago. Okay, great. Um, personally, so I believe that here at Harris Health we use a ten day range. Um, it may have changed since I was working. I'll go. I'll ask. Um, I'll ask Miss Gwen later on just to make sure. But when I was working, we used basically a ten-day period. So it's like if they had their mental period within the last ten days, then I could assume it was safe. If it was beyond the ten-day window, then I couldn't make assumptions, right? I think Miss Shepherd told you guys one month instead. Right? So it varies depending on where you work. Some places will be 10 days, some places will be one month, right? Paris Health, Methodist, St. Luke's, it all depends on where you work, what your protocols are. Yes, Jamie. So if they say 20 days ago, do you stop there and then let them know we're going to verify from a pregnancy test? Or? Okay. Yes, good question. So um, it would depend on your protocols, and usually it depends on what kind of exam it is. So for example, for a chest X-ray, um, if they don't know if they're pregnant or not, right, and the LMP is kind of iffy, um, it is still okay to go ahead with the exam because chest x-rays are up here, they are away from the reproductive organs. We just make sure to be careful, more careful, more aggressive with our shielding. Okay. On the other hand, if we were doing like an abdomen or a pelvis, then at that point I would probably stop there and call the nurse or the doctor to see if they want to go ahead and get that uh, pregnancy test. So we'll just assume that, at least in practice, we'll just assume that all LMPs have been within the past 10 days. So OK, great. So no chance of pregnancy, LMP within the last 10 days. And then we will do our dressing instructions. So. For chest x-rays, we move everything from the waist up. So pants, belts, those can stay on, but anything up above should come off. Okay, so t-shirts, polos, bras, necklaces, um, large hoop earrings, all those do need to come off because they can show up on the x-ray. Um, when you go into clinic in the fall, you will see texts that let patients leave their shirts on. They let patients leave this on or that on, right? That is on the technology, right? It's their image, their name is on it. They can do what they want with that image, right? They're responsible for the quality of the image. But as students, it's important that you build good habits. So regardless of what your texts do, I do want you to be trying to follow proper dressing instructions at all times. So that is everything from the waist up, bottom, like including all bras, even if they're sport bras, including all shirts, even if they're t-shirts, even if it's just like a plain white t-shirt, have them remove it and put on a hospital gown. So, here we do have a hospital gown, notice that it is completely cloth, right? 
no metal, no snaps, no zippers, right? So it will not show up on the X-ray. Okay. Patient, patient should put this on open in the back, right? Open in the back. They should not have this, have a single gown with it on open in the front, right? Because <laughs> no shirt and no bra, <laughs> they're walking around like this. Okay. It's, um, it's not what you want to happen, right? So, always have it open in the back. Some patients who are uncomfortable with a single gown, you can give them two, right? One open in the back, second one open in the front. So that way they are fully covered all the way around. Okay. Um, some other things to watch out for when you are doing dressing instructions. If the patient is here at the hospital, they're coming from upstairs or they're coming from the emergency room, Oftentimes, they will have already gotten an EKG done. For the EKG, they put on the stickers, they have the wires attached to it, they get the EKG reading, they take the wires off, they send them to x-ray with the stickers still on. Those stickers usually look like squares or circles, and in the middle, they have this metal tip, which is where the wires attach to it. That metal tip will show up on the x-ray. If you shoot a picture and you see these three giant glowing dots in the middle of the lungs, those are the EKG leads, those are those EKG stickers. So we do try and remove those whenever possible. Yes? Should we ask the patient if uh, they had any of those stickers on prior to starting? Yes, that is a very good idea. So when I was working, one of the things I would always ask during my edit is, did they do an EKG on you? Did they do the thing with the stickers and the wires? They said, yes. Okay, can you check to see if you still have those stickers on you? They should be up here by your shoulders or they should be down here by your side. You should not feel around it. You're like, okay, yeah, yeah, I feel something here. And then, okay, make sure, could you take these off for me, please? Um, so part of this is also being familiar with where to find those EKG stickers. Now, I'm not gonna quiz you on this, but this is just good to know. Um, if they do a three lead EKG, it's going to be shoulder, shoulder, side. If they do a five lead EKG, it's going to be both shoulders, middle, both sides. If they do a ten lead EKG, it's going to be two shoulders, two chest, four on the side, Oh. Eight, and then where are the last two? Either the and then place. two of them down here. So it's like two, two, four, two. Took a while, I have to think back to my old patients. Right. So knowing where those stickers are can help, and knowing how many of them there should be can help you catch any of them of those stickers before they show up on your X-ray. Yes. Patients with them on their Patients with them on their yeah. back. Yeah. I know they don't go on the back, but I've seen some okay. on their back. All right, well, that's something to watch out for as well. So just ask your patient, okay? Do you have any idea? Do you have any? Right? Because they should know where the tech, the EKG tech put those EKG things. So they'll be your biggest helper in getting rid of those. All right. And so. Once you've done all that, as part of your dressing, I do recommend that you make shielding part of your dressing. So once they come back in with their gown, you should immediately shield your patient. The shield is right over here. Okay, thank you. And remember, shield always goes between the tube and the patient. So, for example, what projection is this? AP, right, anterior, posterior. So shield should be here between the tube and the patient. What projection is this? PA. PA, great, so shield should be between the tube and the patient. What about over here? Lateral. Lateral, great, it should be on the side, right? Oblique at an angle, right, it should be here, right? It should always be between the tube and the patient. 
So do not forget to move it between each projection. Right. One final thing is that you should always have your room set up before you bring your patients in. So once again, that is what I prefer to do. You will see texts that don't do it, but if you look at texts who don't do it and they set their equipment up a lot of patients in the room, it just looks unprofessional. As a patient, you want to be able to walk in, step in front of the board, x-ray, x-ray, and leave. You don't want to be over here and then you hear all this clunking behind you as the tech messes with the equipment, right? It looks, you want it to look nice, you want it to look professional, so everything should be already set up in place to where the tech needs to make minimum movements to get the x-ray done. Make sense? And as you're part of your test out, when you do set up your room ahead of time, that is not counted in your time. But if you try and set up during your exam, now that is being time. So to make things easy on yourself, once again, set up as much as you can before you begin. That way, all your time goes towards positioning the patient rather than messing with the machine. Okay. And so that brings us to actually positioning the patient. That brings us to today's topic, the fun stuff setting up for a chest x-ray. So, um, any questions, first of all, over any of this setup? Any of this stuff I have? Mm -hmm. All right, great. So, first thing to know about chest x-rays. All chest x-rays are done at a 72 inch SID. So, if I'm over here on the wall, I am going to be at 72 inches for all my projections. Okay. All chest x-rays will be done with a 14 by 17 cassette, or in the case of the Bucky, a 14 by 17 collimation. Okay. The collimation should never go bigger than 14 by 17. If you did 17 by 17, that is wrong. Now, can you go smaller? Yes. So can you go 14 by 14? Yes, no problem. 14 by 14 is smaller than 14 by 17. You just can't go bigger. All right. Before each patient, make sure that you wash your hands and that you put on clean gloves. Remember, you are not allowed to take gloves out into the hallway with you. You should not go out to the patient waiting room wearing gloves. Why? Because even if you know the gloves are clean, no one else knows that those gloves are clean. They know that you walk out of the room wearing gloves. They don't know where those gloves have been. It is an infection control issue. So do not wear gloves out in the hallway. Take your gloves off, go out, get your patient, bring them in, and then wash your hands, and then put on gloves. You always want to wash your hands while the patient is in the room. You want to wash your hands in front of the patient. That way the patient knows that you have cleaned your hands. Does that make sense? So you always want to wash your hands in front of the patient, okay, dry them off, and then put on a fresh pair of gloves. So, gloves, right? we've got gloves in here, and we've got some gloves outside as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they're longer, longer. Have you covered hand washing in patient care yet? Not yet? Okay. You will. I think you will within these next two weeks. All right, great. So, fresh pair of gloves, right? Also, 
I want to make sure that I do have my markers. So, I do have my left and right markers in case I need them. For now, I'm just going to put them in. All right. So, who would like to be our first volunteer? Okay, Shamika, come on up. Yes, as the patient. So, we are going to start with the PA chest. If you look in your lab syllabus, you will notice that there are two projections labeled as mandatory. Everyone will perform these two projections for me during lab test out. They are the PA chest and the lateral chest. Together, these two projections form your routine chest exam. If a patient comes in for chest x-rays, you're almost always going to do PA chest, lateral chest. Now, for the PA chest, where do I want to shield? Oh. Yes, I want to shield the back because they are going to be facing the board. So, I'm going to have you hold on to this strap for me, please. Bring this around the back. Thank you. All right. And this is Velcro, so you can just kind of attach it here to the back. There we go. Sorry. No, 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 you're good. Some of them, instead of Velcro, they use a, like a buckle snap. So you just buckle it and then tighten it with the string. All right. How does that feel? Good. So you kind of put it where the umbilical. So you're going to put it here above the waist. The goal is that you're going to have it either barely in the light or barely under the light. You'll see what I mean when I turn this off. Okay. Now, one more thing that I can do. When I first get my patient in the room, I am going to be sizing up my patient. I'm going to be trying to determine two things before I even start. Number one, about how tall is the patient? That way, I can go ahead and before the patient even gets here, I'm going to be like, okay, I think the patient looks about this tall. So I'm going to set everything up to about this height. So I need to move a lot less. But I, can, I just need to make small adjustments once the patient gets up here. Second thing I'm trying to determine, am I going to do this lengthwise or crosswise? And that's going to depend on the patient's body. Right? If the patient is really long and skinny and thin, I'll do it lengthwise. If they're broad-shouldered, I'm going to do it crosswise. Okay? When you go up to the clinics, a lot of techs will do crosswise by default. In lab, we try to teach lengthwise by default. Okay? But when you go up, you see a lot of techs just go crosswise by default. For Jamaica, I am most likely going to go crosswise. So allow me to demonstrate. Come over here, Shamika. Stand facing the board here. Nice and close, nice and close. So if I am lengthwise, right, I have a considerable amount of shadow on both sides of her body. Do you see that? So this is areas that the x-rays will not touch. So I would be concerned that I'm going to be losing parts of her lungs if I leave this lengthwise. Okay. So I would go crosswise instead. And that way, right, I'm going more towards the edge of her body. Does that make sense? Sorry, how did you change to crosswise? You just adjust the collimation. Oh, okay. All you do is you adjust the, adjust the collimation. So I see. Oh, okay. oh, the two knobs. Mm -hmm. right. oh, Earlier it was 14 by 17. I just changed the oh, collimation yeah. so it's a bit shorter this way and it's a bit longer this way. You don't you don't need to worry about the hair. Um, so that is a good point though. Sometimes you have a patient that's really thick hair and the hair hangs down into the lungs, the hair will show up. So with all patients, do try and bring the hair up if possible. In this case, since I'm just demonstrating for lab, I'm not going to worry about that. But in clinic, you do want to try and move the hair out of the way if possible. Did you use a scrub cap? 
Mm -hmm. um, if you have a scrub trap available, you could give the patient a scrub trap to hold their hair in place. If they've got a hair band that broke them, they could use that to hold their hair in place. Or, and I'll show you guys a trick. Occasionally, I've had patients come in without a hair band, but they've had long hair and I really needed them to tie it up. So, I took a glove and I popped off the fingers of the glove. So now I'm left with this loop. Oh. I take the loop, just kind of roll it on, on itself to give it a little bit of strength, and then they can use this as a makeshift hair tie. So, being creative. Yeah. We have our machine set up, we have our patient here facing the door. First thing to do is to find our vertical centering. So we need to know how superior or inferior to center our central ray. To do this, we are first going to look for a bony landmark. Bony landmarks are our guideposts as to figure out where in the anatomy we are aiming. Our bony landmark is going to be C7. If you feel the back of your neck here, if so you start up here by the ear and you feel downwards, you'll feel that suddenly as you feel down, a bone suddenly pops up right here. That first bony structure you feel is your seventh cervical vertebrae. This is your vertebral prominence. So that is called C7, your vertebral prominence. So we are gonna palpate, we're gonna feel for C7. Anytime you palpate, Make sure you warm your patient ahead of time. Or you don't want to suddenly just start putting your hands on the patient without telling them what you're trying to do. So, um, Shamika, I am going to be checking your back to make sure I am in position, okay? You're gonna feel me touching your back, is that okay? Okay, so always check with your patient. So, I'm gonna come up here to the neck first. Okay, I'm gonna feel down until I feel that bump. And then I'm gonna measure seven inches downward. So how do you measure seven inches? We use our own body. In my case, and you can relax, you can keep turn this way. In my case, this is seven inches. How do I know that? It's because I've taken this tape measure before and I've actually measured out seven inches on my fingers. So that's how we know this motion is seven inches. For everyone, it's going to be slightly different how much you need to spread your fingers for seven inches. So I do recommend you all come over here and try it out. Try that out there. 